So this video is about shooting panoramas. Hi everyone. Um, there are two formats that I like to shoot in. One by one square format, square crop. And that's probably because it reminds me of when I used to shoot with Hasselblad 6x6. And the other one is panoramas, which I do a lot of. And that's probably me harking back to my past too, wishing I had bought a Hasselblad X-Pan, which is the 6x17 um, format 35mm by Hasselblad. When I taught in workshops years ago, um, I used to say to people that in order to take a nice photograph, firstly you've got to visualise that image as if you're looking through viewfinder eyes because you can be directed to lots of places which are nice views but they don't always take a nice photograph and there's a difference between a nice view and something which will take a nice photograph. Panoramas on that, uh, on that point are actually quite difficult to visualise because if you're taking multi shots across the way you have no real vision until you stitch them all together of where things are going to be placed in your composition and that can be really quite challenging until you get used with it. Um, with taking panoramas as well to try and help you visualise them for instance if you take, take something with a straight line on it like this here and you go quite wide the wider you go the more convergence you get with your straight lines particularly in the horizontal plane just as he would with an ultra wide angle lens. So one of the things I've learned over years is that when you're taking or shooting panos your optical vantage point has got to be in the middle to the far distance. You're not taking a foreground object with a, with a landscape in the background, you're actually looking at shapes, at colour and at contrast in the middle to far distance. And in order for a landscape panel to work properly, you've got to have a black point. So panoramas without a black point can just look a wee bit blah and just they're not that impactful. I shoot a lot of them because they're really easy to hang on walls. They don't take up a lot of wall space because they're long but they're not too tall. And I generally shoot with a, a longer lens to stop barrel distortion for overlapping and stitching images. So I'm going to show you what I'm looking at. I've actually come round the corner here on the gateway to Paradise Road from Glenorchy to, um, to Queenstown and I've come across this cloud inversion that's up in the hills here and as you can see there's some partially clad clouds way up high above the cloud and you can see landscape below that. Now this is just etching out for some kind of panorama. That's really stunning. Look at this. So what I'm thinking is I'll show you what I'm setting up with and I'll just wait on these clouds to keep on, uh, to keep on moving until that part in the middle there that you can see has cleared and that should allow me to shoot several shots they make up a lovely panorama but if you can see here left to right there's actually some curve and some shape and some composition here don't need the bottom this is a very wide lens but I'm going to shoot right in with a longer lens to get more detail in large so that when I come to print it it's going to be super duper sharp let's have a little look at the camera Right, so on the camera base here we've got the tripod base, we've got this levelling head thing in the middle here. And what this allows me to do is there's two ways you can level your tripod. You need to have your tripod level. And you can either muck around with the legs, to, but that's just downright fiddly. So I got this thing here, which is a Sunway Photo um, levelling head, and that simply allows me to lock off the base here. And it gives me again flexibility just on the tripod head without having to move my tripod legs. So I'm going to get this level. Try the other hand, June. 
So I need to have this tripod base absolutely level for a pano to work. And it needs to work this way because of the way that we stitch the images together. So that's that locked right down. What I then need to do, I don't know if you can see this, So when we put the camera on and put it onto live view, there's two dials here, one up the top and one down the side. Ordinarily, my panos, I get both of them level. Um, level on the side one and level on the top one as well. And that just simply allows me to keep horizons in the middle for shooting my shots. So. I'm going to lock that off just now with this one level at the top which is the level left and right and then this one here on the side which is currently straight ahead but because I'm going to be shooting up the way I'll keep the top one level that's the left and the right and all I'm going to do is just simply lead this back making sure that I'm still level on the camera because I know I've already got my base level and I need to have the base level and the camera level left to right too. That's it level. Now it's time to shoot. Now one of the other things that you see on the top of my tripod here, let me just take this camera off, is this rail here which is called a nodal rail. And the nodal rail allows me to slide this back and forward with the camera on top but additionally, I've also got a double clamp. And this thing here is really cool because it gives me full versatility over where my camera goes in relation to the center of the tripod. So inside each lens, you have what's called a nodal point. And for panoramas to work properly, you have to position the rotation point in and around the nodal point rather than swing the camera from the front. You have to swing it around this nodal point at the rear and that helps with your conversions. So when I set this up, each lens is different but I'm going to assume if I slide this back, slide this all the way back, <coughs> slide this forward because then if I was working with grad filters I could put them in the front and it would clear the front. But I'm assuming here that on this lens the nodal point is round about it's somewhere in here. It's about a third of the way down the lens normally. And um, that just allows me then to rotate this around that central nodal point rather than rotate it around the camera. And it makes a difference. It makes a difference to how they stitch together because there's no convergence, particularly with a wider lens. And the last piece of madness in this setup is my ball head. Now this ball head probably measures about 60 millimeters across and this ball head here is rated for about 40 kilograms. And I don't need that much bearing, but when I lock stuff down on landscape shoots, this just cannot move. And the 40 kilogram ball head allows it to stay perfectly, perfectly still. Now there's a few other knobs on here there's this one here which allows me to rotate across the already level base. There's the big one here for loosening this off. But there's also a friction, friction one here for fine tuning. I can tighten this up to move it ever so slightly just to get perfectly level. And then lock everything down. And then once we've do, done this, everything is good to go. It's a heavy setup though. So the cloud's actually quite nice now, and uh, <clears throat> we've got some lighter cloud in the bottom, we've got some break up at the top, but we're still seeing true black point through the top here, because we need that black point to ground image. But we've also got some lovely colours over the left hand side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a light metre reading. I want the texture of the clouds to remain the same. So what I've got here is I've actually got I've got a 60th of a second at f13, so I'm actually quite happy with that. I'm going to shoot this at 160 millimetres. 
So your panoramas will be determined by two critical components. One is your X dimension and the other one is your Y dimension. And your X dimension will generally be determined by the number of shots that you take from left to right or right to left. Your Y dimension on the other hand will be determined by your focal length, whether you're shooting in a vertical format or whether you're shooting in a horizontal format. That Y determination will be set by the focal length that you're shooting at or how you crop in post. Now there's something quite nice about panoramas when you see people looking at them because all of the, the, the format lends itself to being viewed hung on a wall when they're hung properly because all of the data is at eye height. You don't have to look up and you don't have to look down. Everything is right in front of you and it really, really draws you in. It's quite nice to look at when it's done right. In the field, what I do find is that if I'm trying to, to punch in, um, I don't always get a longer lens all the time. I did see uh, Brendan Van Son's 1-400mm uh, L glass for his Canon being stolen by Thomas Heaton when they were in a shoot in Patagonia. And uh, Thomas was punching in on mountains away in the distance with his 70-200mm lens and he couldn't quite get in tight enough with that 8.5 format of his uh, full frame camera and C size, C -size uh, sensors are the same. And he ended up running from the camera and stealing Brendan's 1-400 so that he could punch in further. But what I find in the field is that when I need to punch in further and I'm generally shooting in, in vertical format to cram as much data in, I'll simply turn that vertical frame on its side because the illusion of the focal length that you're shooting at is determined with your Y dimension and vice versa. So if you want the illusion of zooming in, go from a vertical to a horizontal. And this is a good example here of two images taken side by side at the same time roughly, same focal length, one in portrait and one in landscape. I need to check my focus, so we'll go right in here. Focus is perfect. Now that's looking really, really cool. That's really cool. And to try and visualize this in frame, I'm gonna move this with my hands when this is loose, just across the frame to see what I need to take. It's where I stop and where I start is the problem here. Now make sure you've got everything on manual. Your focus, your exposure settings and your white balance which will prevent you getting changes from frame to frame. Get some sun behind me now which will just catch the peaks up here. And I think I'm going to take this. So this one here I'm going to start right to left because I think the clouds are moving from right to left. And take the first one. That's so cool. When I overlap my shots, I overlap them by 50%. And I always start my shots at a particular point on the left or the right hand frame so that if I'm going to do a multi row one, I know where I started. And it's always 50% overlap sideways and also 50% up and down if I'm going to do a multi-row. That's two taken. That's the third one. And I will see So that's a four horizontal shot panel. Now that's actually quite that's going to be quite wide. But if I take more than I need, I can then crop in to get a final frame. So one piece of advice is probably don't just take what you think you need. Because sometimes there's problems with the stitching tool that mucks up your final image. So always take more than you need. So the light's changing up here, so I'll take one more. But one thing I would say is that between uh, sets of panoramas, 
always put your hand in front of the frame to take a blank frame. That allows you to separate your frames in post because there's nothing worse than having 30 fo photographs that all look similar and you don't know how to merge them. That's pretty cool. I'll leave you with this photograph and I will show you how I do this in post. So it's into Lightroom and I'll show you how easy it is to merge these photographs into your panorama. So what we will do here is we'll open up Lightroom and we'll maximise this to maximum screen so we can see several photographs here, some of which are separated by a black frame. And that shows you just how easy it is to identify the frames between these two black frames to define your set of photographs for a panel. Down the bottom here though you can see that I've not put a black frame in and you can see how interesting this would be to try and work out which photographs would be used for any given panorama. So you need to put a black frame between each set that you do. So in the interest of easiness, what I'll do is I'll take, I'll take these three actually. One, two, three, and we right click and we merge these in a panorama. Now I would always advise you shoot in RAW and when you shoot in RAW and you create a panorama, the program will do this itself and it shows the panorama here. So boundary warp, maximize that to flatten out any white edges you've got due to bad levels. And we merge this. And when we merge this, this actually creates its own DNG file. And DNG file is for digital negative. And with the DNG file, you carry forward all of your dynamic range and your raw qualities into that single combined file. Now it takes a few minutes to get this done, but it creates its own single file. So wait for it to digitize and now it's a DNG file. So go to the develop module and we process this in the normal way we would a single file. So let me just work on this real quick. Start with the crop. Take this down, set the white point because of the snow. That's the white point set. Take some blue out, orange luminance up. Check curves layer, adjustments, check temperature. So it really is that simple and I hope you found this video worthwhile. I'll leave you with these shots right at the very end but until next time you keep shooting, have a shot at panoramas, have fun and until then we'll see you soon. Cheerio! Thank <laughs> you.